On December 6, 1967, Judd Apatow was born in Flushing, Queens, the son of Maury Apatow, a real estate developer, and Tamara Shad, who ran the record label Mainstream Records, founded by her father, Bob Shad. He was raised in Syosset, Long Island. When he was 12 years old, his parents divorced. As a child, Apatow lived mainly with his father and visited his mother on weekends. Apatow's mother spent a summer working at a comedy club which is where Judd was first exposed to live stand-up comedy. Apatow's childhood heroes were Steve Martin, Bill Cosby, and the Marx Brothers. He got his comic start washing dishes at the Long Island Eastside Comedy Club, and at Syosset High School, he hosted a radio program called Comedy Club on the school's 125-watt radio station, WKWZ. Apatow began performing stand-up comedy at age 17, during his senior year of high school. After graduating from high school in 1985, he moved to Los Angeles and enrolled in the screenwriting program at University of Southern California. While at USC, he hosted a number of on-campus comedy night events featuring headliners such as Saturday Night Live performer Kevin Nealon. He dropped out of college during his second year and later moved into an apartment with Adam Sandler, whom he met at the Improv. He competed in the Johnny Walker Comedy Search in 1989. Shortly thereafter, Apatow was introduced by manager Jimmy Miller to Gary Shandling, which resulted in Apatow being hired as a writer for the 1991 Grammy Awards that year, which Shandling hosted. He went on to co-produce comedy specials by Roseanne Arnold, Tom Arnold, and Jim Carrey. In 1992, Apatow appeared on HBO's 15th annual Young Comedian Special and shortly afterwards went on to co-produce, co-create and executive produce uh, the Ben Stiller show for Fox. Despite critical acclaim and an Emmy Award for Apatow and the rest of the writing staff, Fox canceled the show in 1993. Apatow went on to join HBO's The Larry Sanders Show in 1993 as a writer and consulting producer, and he later served as a co-executive producer and director of an episode during the show's final season in 1998. He earned six Emmy nominations for his work on Larry Sanders. During this time, he also worked as a consulting producer and staff writer for the animated show The Critic, starring John Lovitz. In 1995, Apatow was hired to do an uncredited rewrite for a script for the movie The Cable Guy, which was released in 1996 to mixed reviews. It was during pre-production of the film that he met his future wife, actress Leslie Mann. His next script was titled Making Amends, in which Owen Wilson played an alcoholic, but this film was never made. Apatow did uncredited rewrites of Adam Sandler films Happy Gilmore and The Wedding Singer, he also did uncredited rewrites of John Car- Jim Carrey films Liar Liar and Bruce Almighty. He was also featured in four tracks on Sandler's 1996 album What the Hell Happened to Me. In 1999, Apatow created Sick in the Head, a multi-camera sitcom pilot about a psychiatrist, but it was not picked up by Fox. This freed up Apatow to serve as executive producer for the award-winning series Freaks and Geeks, which debuted in 1999. After his cancellation, Apatow was the executive producer and creator of the series Undeclared, which reused Seth Rogen in the main cast and other Freaks and Geeks characters in recurring roles. Although both shows were quickly canceled, they won critical acclaim. In 2001, Apatow created North Hollywood, a pilot that featured Jason Siegel, Kevin Hart, Seth Rogen, Phil Hendry, and Judge Reinhold. The pilot was not picked up by ABC, nor was Life on Parole, starring David Herman as a dissatisfied parole officer whose roommate happens to be one of his parolees. In 2004, Apatow produced the feature film Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy. The film was a box office success. He made his feature film directorial debut in 2005 with The 40-Year-Old Virgin, which he also co-wrote with the film star Steve Carell for Universal Pictures. 
The movie grossed more than $175 million globally. In 2005, Apatow co-wrote with Nicholas Stoller the feature film comedy Fun with Dick and Jane starring Jim Carrey and Tia Leone. The film grossed $205 million worldwide. His second film, the romantic comedy Knocked Up, was released in June of 2007 to wide critical acclaim. The film was also a commercial hit, continuing Apatow's newfound mainstream success. In August 2007, Apatow produced the film Superbad, which was written by Seth Rogen and his writing partner Evan Goldberg. A concept Rogen and Goldberg has created as teens, Apatow convinced Rogen to write the film as a vehicle for himself in 2000. Rogen and Goldberg finished writing the film, but were unable to find a studio interested in producing it. After the success of Anchorman and the 40-year-old version, Apatow was still unable to sell Superbad. It was only after he produced the commercial hit Talladega Nights, The Battle of Ricky Bobby, that Sony Pictures Entertainment produced Superbad. They also decided to produce Pineapple Express, a stoner action movie that Apatow felt was more commercial. In August of 2007, Superbad opened at number one in the box office to critical acclaim, taking in $33 million in its opening weekend. It would gross over $170 million worldwide. Apatow served as producer and co-writer along with director Jake Kasten for the biopic spoof Walk Hard starring, starring John C. Riley. While the film received positive reviews, it was essentially a box office bomb. In 2008, he served as producer for Drill Bit Taylor starring Owen Wilson and Leslie Mann and written by Seth Rogen. It opened in March to mixed reviews and did poorly at the box office. For the rest of 2008, Apatow produced the comedy films Forgetting Sarah Marshall starring Jason Segel and Kristen Bell and Step Brothers, which reunites Talladega Nights co-stars Will Ferrell and John C. Riley. I know you touched my drum set! Get out of my face! Alright, that's it! You destroyed my hope! Oh, you beat me up in your sleep! You're adults. It's time you started acting like adults. What?! We're slow learners, and we're not particularly good listeners. Hello, how are you? Oh, 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 oh my gosh! Have a great time! Step Brothers. 39 year old Brendan Huff, played by Will Ferrell, and Dale Doback, played by John C. Riley, are immature adults living at home with Brennan living with his divorced mother, Nancy, played by Mary Steenbergen, and Dale living with his widowed father, Robert, played by Richard Jenkins. Robert and Nancy fall in love and get married, forcing Brennan and Dale to live together as stepbrothers. They initially hate each other, and although Dale orders Brennan not to touch his drums, he touches them with his testicles. As a result, a fight erupts between them, Robert grounds them with no television for a week and they're ordered to find jobs within a month or be evicted. Brennan's arrogant younger brother, Derek, played by Adam Scott, who is a successful helicopter leasing agent, comes for dinner and he openly ridicules Dale and Brennan and Dale punches him in the face. Brennan is awed that Dale stood up to Derek and Derek's wife, Alice, played by Catherine Hahn, is sexually attracted to Dale and starts an affair with him. They soon become friends, bonding over their shared interests. In the meantime, Robert has scheduled several interviews for them. They decide to be interviewed as a team, and they perform poorly, confused that the human resources director is named Pam. The next interview with the sporting goods manager, played by Seth Rogen, seems to be going well until Dale farts. They are attacked on their way home by children, who force Brennan to eat dog feces. Uh, they, Robert and Nancy reveal that they plan to sell the house, with Derek acting as an agent. They also sign Brendan and Dale up for therapy and put a deposit on an apartment for, for them. 
In the meantime, Dale and Brennan did their best to sabotage the sale of the house, dressing up as a Nazi and KKK member to sabotage one potential sale, and pretending that Brennan died of inhaling asbestos to sabotage the other potential sale. Dale tells his therapist that his life was like the plot for Goodwill Hunting, while Brennan is attracted to his therapist, but he is, she is, is not attracted to him. Uh, Dale and Brennan hold a birthday party for Derek, and they pitch a, they present a pitch video for their entertainment company, Prestige Worldwide. This includes a music video called Boats and Hose, which they filmed on Robert's boat without his permission. But the video shows the boat crashing, shattering Robert and Nancy's sailing dreams and straining their marriage. On Christmas, Robert and Nancy announce they're getting divorced, upsetting Brennan and Dale, who blame each other. They sleepwalk, and Robert wakes them, and he is attacked by them. They're forced out of the home they shared with the Robert and Nancy, get separate apartments, live independently, and gradually become functioning adults. Brennan gets a job at Derek's helicopter leasing firm and volunteers to oversee a prestigious event, the Catalina Wine Mixer. Reasoning that either Brennan will fail, giving him the opportunity to humiliate Brennan, or succeed, thus justifying his existence to the company, Derek agrees. Uh, he hires the catering company that employs Dale and invites Robert and Nancy to attend. They both accept the invitation. The party goes well until the lead singer of the hired Billy Joel cover band, uh, they explicitly play uh, Billy Joel songs from the 80s and 90s, not the 70s. Uh, well, the lead singer of the hired band uh, loses his temper with a heckler and leaves. Derek blames Brendan for this and fires him. Robert regrets that he has forced Dale and Brendan to grow up and urges them to be their eccentric child at heart selves again and perform to save the party. The pair take the stage and Brendan sings Poor T. Volari, uh, while Dale accompanies him on drums, uh, occasionally singing Boats and Hose. The two make amends and Dale breaks off his relationship with Alice. Six months later, Robert and Nancy are back together living in their old house, while Brendan and Dale have turned prestige worldwide into a successful entertainment company that owns various karaoke bars and clubs. Robert has turned his boat into a treehouse, and Brendan's therapist confesses her attraction for him. During the closing credits, Dale and Brendan exact revenge on the school children who previously beat them up. And that's the end of the movie. When I got this three movie collection, I assumed Talladega Nights was the best movie, so the other two movies would be obviously be worse, so I was prepared to be disappointed. But I wasn't disappointed, and I found this movie to be quite funny, which must make me pretty happy, and I guess I am. Uh, to be clear, most of the humor does not come from the plot, which is pretty conventional, and that is a basic storyline about losers seeking redemption. And as one of the people posting reviews on IMDb has noted, the idea of a child being trapped in the body of an adult has been done. Uh, Witness Big, uh, starring Tom Hanks, 13 going on, 30, um, and Jack, starring Robin Williams. Uh, rather, most of the humor in this movie comes from the chemistry of uh, Will Ferrell and John C. Riley, and the scenes where they display their antics. Um, for example, having a fight, stacking buck bunk beds on top of each other, this does not go well, by the way, interviewing for jobs, which again, does not go well, and finally, making a video which, once again, does not go well. Basically, the, the two men have the brains of a seven-year-old, and slow seven-year-olds at that, um, in adult bodies. This makes a lot of the, the humor stupid, yet funny. And there may actually be a more sublime meaning to this movie. Um, it, here, at, in current times, which, by the way, is the United States in 2023, we have retarded the maturation project, process. Uh, one remembers, for example, the story of Jackie Gleason. His father left the family at a young age, and it soon became apparent that he had to support the family. Um, so he went to high school, and although by law, by New, in uh, New York 
New York State law, you have to go to school until you're 16 years old. Uh, the His high school principal at the school Gleason attended waived the rules. He said, you know, um, so you could drop out before 16 so you get a job to support his family. So I was like, yeah, what can you do? You, you kind of have to support your family. Uh, it was the Depression era, and people grew up relatively quickly. Um, and like then later you had like World War II, where uh, people grew up relatively quickly. And, you know, imagine like going to war and, and having your friend, your best friend, die. That would suck. I never had to deal with that. Uh, uh, but over time, people weren't grown up until like. The 50s and 60s, like people didn't grow up until they graduated high school, usually at 18 years old. At some point, this extended to college, which by now is like graduating high school. I mean, it's like you get like the education level of, of, of a high school graduate from graduating college. Uh, then, 15 years ago, the, uh, the United States elected Obama as president. His signature legislation was Obamacare. And one of the features of Obamacare was extending the period of time a child can be on their parents' health insurance policy until uh, 25. Um, so, what does this imply? This, this, the implication of this is that um, college graduates will not get a job that uh, offers free health insurance. Um, or that, or that maybe they didn't go to college and they still couldn't get get a job that has health insurance by the time they're 25 years old. Um, what we end up with is the maturation process retarded until I'm guessing about 30 years old. Um, this movie just takes it to the extreme where 40 year old people are acting like uh, children. I don't think that there are 40 year olds anywhere on this planet that act as immaturely as Will Ferrell and John C. Riley do. But that doesn't make the movie any less funny. While this movie conspicuously did not win any Oscars, one has to admire Will Ferrell and Adam McKay for nonetheless throwing in everything but the kitchen sink, including an a cappella version of a Guns N' Roses song, a scrotum on a drum kit, and of course, Bokes and Hoes. Here, the screeners are conscious that a hard R, with all its crudeness, will sell, and apparently they were right, because Step Brothers, though not an exemplar of the Feral McKay Apatow portfolio, did pretty well at the box office, grossing $128.1 million on a budget of $65 million. This movie was rated R for crude and sexual content and pervasive language. There's also violence, though nothing serious. Um, Needless to say, this movie is not family friendly, but as long as you take that into account, it's a funny movie. Uh, the actors in this movie did a pretty good job here. Richard Jenkins and Mary Steenberger are good as the suffering parents, and Will Ferrell and John C. Riley give inspired performances as man children. One has to wonder how much Riley uh, plays the part as a variant of Dr. Steve Brule, a character he played on. Uh, Tim and Eric's awesome show, Great Job, that was so good, it spawned a spinoff. Check it out. Uh, but while Dr. Steve Rule thinks he's an adult, Dale makes no apologies for basically being a child. And none of the other actors are conspicuously bad. Witness Seth Rogen as a sporting goods store manager, and you have to watch that because he's, he's like, uh, he's the, the um, laid-back st uh, store manager who's like, well, I just, I just want somebody that I can basically hang out with for 12 hours, and you don't seem to be weird, so uh, I, I'm, I'm going to hire you. Let, let's just do this. And then and then, uh, Dale, played by John C. Riley, farts, and that's pretty much the end of it. Um, maybe Step Brothers was that good a movie. Or maybe my mind has been warped by watching uh, Will Ferrell movies. Uh, by the way, this is the fifth Will Ferrell movie that low-budget reviews has featured. In any case, I was expecting to be disappointed, and I wasn't disappointed. Step Brothers is at least as good as Talladega Nights was. There are some gags that don't work, but thankfully, they are few. Uh, so I give this movie a 7 out of 10.
Once again, this recapping of DVD extras is relatively short because there were no extras on this DVD. There wasn't even chapter selection, it's just an option to play the movie. Um, there are, however, closed captions available. So again, this DVD was disappointing in the lack of extras. Step Brothers is a good movie and worth watching, but the DVD is disappointing because of the lack of extras. Uh, there are some people who may want to rewatch the movie, although I would rank the rewatchability of this movie as relatively low. Um, it's something to think about. Um, it's funny, but it's not really that funny where I'd want to rewatch it. I only slightly recommend this DVD set. I'm going to watch the last movie in this collection, uh, which is, uh, what is it? Um, the Other Guys. Yeah, I'm going to watch The Other Guys next, but not next week, because I'm going to review what else? Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Well, that's it for this DVD review. One note, I was informed that I violated community guidelines for a reply to a comment. Um, I'm not going to comment on that any further other than because uh, it may violate YouTube's community guidelines. Rather than fight it, I thought maybe I'd take the opportunity to migrate to another social media platform that respects freedom of expression. It was just pretty much every other social media platform that, that uh, shares videos other than YouTube. So I currently have an Odyssey channel. I'm going to include links to it in the description of this video. So uh, if you have time, uh, click on that link and uh, consider subscribing to, to my Odyssey channel. Um, also, I'm migrating my YouTube videos over to Rumble, so that should be available soon. And I should have a BitChute channel too. Um, if there's any other uh, video social media platforms that I, uh, video sharing uh, social media platforms that I should be uh, subscribed to, uh, let me know about that and I'll, I'll try to have a channel for that. Um, next week's going to be tough because I need to allocate enough time for compiling my low budget review of planes, trains, and automobiles. So like and comment and uh, subscribe to this channel so you'll be informed of the latest low budget review. Uh, as always, thanks for watching.